By the beginning of the 2nd century BC, Rome had established itself as the dominant power in the western Mediterranean after defeating the empire of Carthage. To the east, more than a century before, Alexander of Macedon had astonished the classical world by conquering the mighty Persian Achaemenid Empire. At the heart of Alexander's numerically inferior force was the Macedonian phalanx. Among Alexander's successor empires, the Diadochi, the near impenetrable wall of spikes comprised of 15 18 foot long pikes was the gold standard. Rectangular units consisting of 256 men were arrayed in a long line forming a human bulwark. While the flanks were protected by a variety of skirmishers, light infantry, and cavalry to prevent the slow moving and unwieldy colossus from being encircled by enemy troops. Considered a minor regional power for many centuries, the tenacious Romans weathered a variety of defeats from rival Italian tribes and states, such as the Etruscans and Samnites, before being sacked by a band of Gallic Celts. However, after every defeat, Rome endured and adapted, eventually overcoming every major foe in the region. Like the Macedonians, the Romans had initially fought in the system descended from the Greek hopolite phalanx. However, after a string of defeats from the Roman Italian neighbor, the Samnites, they wholesale abandoned the phalanx and adopted the maniple system. Here, smaller units, typically consisting of 120, 80, or as few as 60 men, were still able to form a formidable wall of shields. These smaller, more tactically flexible units could detach and exploit unusual or unforeseen battlefield situations, such as obstacles or a gap opening up in the enemy line. Because the long spear was abandoned for the short Gladius Hispanicus as the legionary's primary weapon, the unit could quickly change the direction it was fighting in, even multiple directions at once, which made these units much more resilient against encirclement. The legionary was also armed with a pilum, a specialized type of javelin thrown before impact with enemy troops, after which any gaps or weak points that developed could be exploited by the ensuing charge. Rome had clashed with Philip V of Macedon during the Second Punic War with Carthage. This First Macedonian War saw much maneuvering, but no decisive battles. Two years after the defeat of Hannibal at Zama, Rome resumed war with Macedon. In this Second Macedonian War, both armies met in a decisive battle when they stumbled upon each other at a ridge of rough terrain called Sinocephaly, named after the unusual shape of the mounds located there. Both infantry and cavalry forces were roughly equivalent size, with the Romans holding a slight advantage in infantry as well as 20 war elephants that they brought to the field. Philip rushed to take the high ground on his right, clashing with the Romans who advanced to meet him there. On his left, the less experienced Macedonians were still struggling to form in a proper formation when the Romans, reinforced by 20 war elephants, made contact with them. The force of a well-ordered Macedonian charge was too much for the Roman left. While the right took advantage of the Macedonian ill-preparedness, and with the aid of elephant and cavalry contingents, were able to keep the Macedonian left from advancing, and even began to slowly gain ground on them. At this point in the battle, a few hundred men would have died and another thousand seriously wounded on either side, in roughly equal proportions, with perhaps a slight advantage to the Macedonians. This is when a Roman tribune, whose name has been lost to history, noticed the large gap that had formed between the Macedonian phalanx, too large for the skirmishers to protect. On his own discretion, he determined the Roman right would hold, and detach 20 maniples, roughly a little over 2,000 men. Charging the rear of the Macedonian right, completely focused on their relentless charge, they were completely caught off guard. The disheartened Macedonian left helplessly watched as their veterans under the command of their king were mercilessly cut down as they attempted to flee in every direction, taking off their armor. Eventually, they had enough and followed suit. Despite this decisive Roman victory, Philip V was allowed to stay on the Macedonian throne. He did have to disband his entire navy, a large portion of his army, and send 71,000 pounds of silver along with his only legitimate son, Demetrius, to Rome as a hostage to ensure his good behavior. Perseus, the son of one of Philip's concubines, convinced his father that upon Demetrius' return, he had grown far too close and too fond of Rome. Demetrius failed to convince his father otherwise and was executed. This shocked the Romans who had released Demetrius because Philip had proved to be such a reliable ally after Sinocephaly, helping them defeat the Spartans and the Seleucid Empire. In multiple decisive engagements, the decision to execute his younger son tormented Philip and was suspected to have caused his rapid decline in health and eventual death a year later. Perseus now became king, 
initially making great effort to convince Rome of his friendship. However, he began to make alliances and fund an assortment of anti-Roman tribes and kingdoms, from Thrace, southern Greece to Asia Minor. This incited the Romans to invade again in a third Macedonian war. The first several years of this conflict saw the taking and retaking of fortresses which Perseus had built and fortified cities. After several non-decisive engagements, both main armies met at Pydna. Following the Roman victory at Sinocephaly and victories over the Seleucid Empire at Thermopylae and Magnesia, where the Romans again defeated Macedonian-style phalanxes, much of the Hellenistic world would have remained unconvinced of the superiority of the Roman manipular system over the system descended from that which Alexander used to conquer much of the known world. At Sinocephaly, the Romans had numerical superiority, and the loss could be blamed on the incompetence of allowing such a large gap to form in the phalanx. At Thermopylae, not to be confused with the Spartan last stand at the same location centuries before, the Romans had an army double the size of the enemy, and successfully circumvented the smaller force. And Magnesia, the troop quality of the Seleucid army was extremely poor, and the inexperienced non-professional levies that made up much of the phalanx lacked the technical expertise to maneuver correctly. At Pydna, none of these factors held back the Macedonians. Here, the Macedonian army commanded by Perseus had chosen the battlefield and was numerically superior. Some 21,000 men formed a massive phalanx, with ample amounts of light infantry skirmishers and a larger cavalry contingent to protect the flanks. Unlike Sinocephaly, which chaotically began as both armies stumbled into each other, here, both armies were well rested and had camped on opposite sides of a small stream the night before. The foragers from both armies used the stream as a source for water, and as fighting broke out among them the following afternoon, both armies that had already deployed moved in. The Macedonians took the initiative and crossed the stream. Later, the Roman general Paulus admitted how the sight of the 20,000-man Macedonian phalanx approaching filled him with terror and amazement. This was for good reason. As the Macedonian phalanx's charge made impact with the Roman maniples, the force was such that the Macedonian pikes pierced directly through the Roman shields, mail, and helmets. The Romans were unable to create any significant gaps with their pila, and as they tried to hack the heads off the pikes, this proved to be a totally ineffective tactic against the well-ordered phalanx, and were forced to give up ground. Roman officers began to despair. One tore his garments, consumed by an impotent fury, as another flung his unit's standard among the enemy troops, leading his men in a bloody but ill-fated charge to retrieve it. The only Roman unit that found any major success early in the battle were the 34 North African war elephants, which were wrecking havoc among the light infantry who were protecting the phalanx's left wing. However, as time went on, the phalanx that had been crushing its foes like a giant spiked steamroller ground to a halt. As the Romans weathered the impact of the initial charge and were pushed back to increasingly rough terrain, the small gaps began to appear in the phalanx. Their fallen comrades also made the phalanx less cohesive and sluggish as it advanced over their bodies. This had been what the Romans had been waiting for. Their smaller units charged into the breaches over the rough terrain. There, the heavier Roman shield, armor, and short thrusting sword had the advantage. The failing gites were forced to drop their pikes and defend themselves with their swords. This allowed more Romans to close the gap and soon the entire phalanx was falling apart. According to one source, Perseus fled the battlefield in an act of cowardice, and another states that he was wounded from an enemy arrow and left the field to receive treatment. Either way, most followed suit and began to flee, with the exception of one veteran unit of 3,000 pikemen that refused to retreat or surrender and bitterly fought to the last man. After the battle, Perseus and his children were taken back to Rome. Macedon was split into several small republics under heavy Roman influence, and General Paulus was granted a triumph, Rome's greatest honor. Now there was little doubt as to the legion's superiority. A well-trained Macedonian phalanx was more powerful and could repel veteran Roman legions under ideal conditions, which the Roman system could fully exploit in a way that the Macedonian phalanx's previous foes were unable to accomplish as effectively. Any mention of the legion versus phalanx should make a mention of Pyrrhus of Epirus, who invaded the Italian peninsula and defeated the Romans in two major battles, but suffered such high casualties, which is where the term Pyrrhic victory was coined, that he was compelled to call off the campaign and return home. Through these defeats, the Romans gained great insight into the phalanx's strengths and weaknesses, and the devastation that elephants could cause to massed infantry. It is interesting to speculate how pivotal the often ignored elephants were in the Roman victories at Sinocephaly and Pinda. In both battles, the elephants caused the Macedonian left to slow, stop, or reverse. And had they not been there, would the increased effectiveness of the Macedonian charge 
cause any decisive change. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Also, much is made of the fact that in Alexander's day, there was a greater emphasis on combined arms compared to later Macedonian armies, which more heavily relied on the phalanx. Could this have made a decisive change? This has been Epimetheus. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to get notifications every time I make a new video. If you're a new sub, leave a comment and say hi to the group here. And if you would like to help me keep making videos like that, you could do so on Patreon, link at the top of the description. I'm a one-man team, researching, writing, drawing, editing, and speaking to you now. Can't afford to now? No problem. Just keep watching and leave lots of likes. I appreciate all your guys' support. Thank you.